welcomed by each of the flight attendant seats. If there was a major problem, the pilot would have called us. To troubleshoot the problem, the L-1011 climbs to 2,000 feet and heads west towards the Everglades. The captain then puts the plane on autopilot. Everybody wants to find the solution. That's just nature. We're human. We want to accomplish the mission. The crew suspects nothing more than a faulty light bulb. The co-pilot starts to replace it, but can't get the new bulb to go in. They fought with this thing for, for several minutes. The captain then instructed the flight engineer to go down and see if he could manually see an alignment stripe that is on the nose gear that you can see from a small viewport down underneath the flight deck. But it's too dark to see. Meanwhile, the captain and the co-pilot are still struggling with the light bulb. And this is where the insidious nature of human error begins to show itself. Ideally, someone does nothing but monitor the autopilot. But with the, the difficulty that the first officer was having with the bulb, the captain, understandably, wanted to try to help him. No one was concentrating on monitoring the autopilot. The crew is unaware that the airplane is slowly descending from 2,000 to 900 feet. Then they hear from the control tower. How's it going out there, Eastern? And the first officer looks up and realizes something's wrong with the altitude. And he said, we're still at 2,000, right? And the captain begins to look and says, what happened to the altitude? And they begin to take corrective action. But it's too late. The engines roared and we hit and the world exploded. It was a huge fireball. The plane rips apart. The crash is scattered over an expansive area. I was in the tail and the tail section broke off and we began spinning and we spun 1,500 feet. And at the end of the spin, the tail actually turned over and when it did, the floor underneath me split and I dropped out. In the swamp, Raposa is still strapped to her seat as jet fuel rains down on her. Initially, I screamed, you know, somebody help me. And I couldn't hear anyone. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I may, have, I may be the only survivor. But she is not alone. I have never been in anything so dark in my entire life. That's how dark it was. And I tell people, the only thing, time you could tell somebody was in front of you, you could smell their breath. Otherwise, you would never know they were there. Passenger Ron Infantino is also one of the 75 passengers and crew that miraculously survive. Swamp water is up to his chin. Every bit of my clothing was blown right off. The only thing I had left was the rims of my socks. That was the only thing. And I thought it was a nightmare. I, I, I couldn't believe. I was totally in shock. And then, of course, I'm yelling for my wife. And that was the last I ever saw of her. I never saw her again. Ron's wife, Lily, actually survives the impact, but is knocked unconscious and drowns face down in the water. The captain and co-pilot are also killed, along with 98 others. Yeah, what was the last thing you remember now, this crash? I don't remember nothing, man. But flight attendant Patricia McQuig manages to stay alive. I was still up in my jump seat, high on top of the wreckage. I couldn't get out. I had no shoes on, part of my uniform blew off, and I was tied up. Federal investigators say they're going to hold a full public inquiry into the crash of an Eastern Airlines jumbo jet near Miami's airport. But what caused the plane to crash? The mystery lies in why the autopilot suddenly failed to hold its altitude. It turns out it wasn't a mechanical failure, but rather human error. According to the safety board report, when the captain leans across to help with the light bulb in the landing gear indicator, he hits the control column, shutting off the autopilot. The warning alarm goes off, but it seems no one notices. The crew not only didn't respond to it, they didn't actually hear it, or if they did, they didn't process the significance of it. It turned into a fiasco. Everybody was concentrating on this light bulb. Investigators also discovered that the nose gear had been down the whole time. Planes can still land safely with just the main landing gear. But aviation experts say the crew followed the correct procedure. Pilots always carry reserve fuel on the airplanes so that there wasn't a pressing 
time criticality of we have to go land now. If they landed with the nose gear up, it's going to cause damage to it. It's going to be out of service for a period of time. There's going to be an investigation. Out of this 1972 tragedy came crew resource management, a training requirement that calls for crew members to monitor each other's actions, ensuring that someone must always monitor the aeroplane flight path. If there's a problem today, that crew resource management means the captain has to designate somebody to stay in control of the plane while they try to resolve the problem, whether it's in the cockpit or whether it's in the cabin. Improvements have also been made to the autopilot, including more obvious warnings for altitude loss. The warning system is louder and more force is required to disengage it. Many survivors have stayed in contact and are working on a proposed memorial. Some of them have made a return trip to the crash site. Still very emotional coming out here. I, I can't believe that I survived this. Yeah. I can literally close my eyes. The actual impact, I can visualize it to this day, exactly how it happened. After all this time, remnants of the plane are still embedded in the muddy swamp. Very We're looking about uh, 15 foot of wing. Part of it exposed, about four okay. feet of it here, is, you can see it exposed, and the rest is under the water, but you can still see some of it. You can still see some of the eastern, some of our colors. Look, see the blues? Almost four decades later, Patricia McQuig is still a flight attendant. Ron Infantino married again, and Beverly Raposa still flies regularly for her work. But the crash is never far from their thoughts. They were so distracted with the light bulb that nobody, literally nobody, was flying the plane. Could you imagine? Coming up. A Colombian plane mysteriously crashes just miles from its destination. Avianca 052, heavy New York, good evening, climb maintain 3000. A Boeing 707 is just a few miles from its destination when all four of the plane's engines fail. Avianca 052, radar contact loss. The jet silently falls through the clouds, slamming into a wooded hill on Long Island, New York, killing 73 people on board. There are no mechanical failures, no structural problems of any kind. It turns out the plane simply runs out of fuel. But how can such a fatal blunder happen? Twenty fifth of January, nineteen ninety, when Avianca Flight 052 leaves Medellin, Colombia, just after three p.m., the tanks have more than enough fuel for the 2,100-mile trip to New York. They had approximately 81,000 pounds of jet fuel on the airplane when they departed. They had done the calculations for the flight plan, the amount of fuel they would burn going to New York, a reserve, some holding fuel, and then also enough fuel to go to Boston and land. With more than enough fuel, that shouldn't be a problem, but it soon becomes one. In New York, the weather was bad, so as they came up the East Coast, they began to be issued holding instructions, and they held for three different times. The delays total 77 minutes. Around 8.20 p.m., they have only a little more than 14,000 pounds of fuel left, enough for another hour or so in the air. During those holding patterns, that's when the, the flight engineer should have made sure that the fuel levels were fine. And Avianca 052 Heavy, uh, I'm going to bring you about 15 miles northeast and then turn you back home for the approach. Is that fine with you and your fuel? I guess so. Thank you very much. They inquired with the air traffic controllers about how much longer it was going to be. They were complaining about their fuel levels. Air traffic control asked where their alternate was, which was filed for Boston. But the first officer, who was the pilot handling the radios, told them that they could no longer make Boston. And that very significant statement was lost on air traffic control. At 9.22 p.m., Avianca Flight 052 is finally cleared to land. But with an extremely low cloud ceiling above JFK and strong wind shear, the pilot misses the attempt. The plane is again diverted from the airport. Nowhere did the first officer ever use the word emergency. 
if that word had been used, they would have given them immediate priority to try to get them on the ground. Avianca 52, climb, maintain 3,000. Uh, negative, sir, we, we're just running out of fuel. We, we're good. Okay, 3,000, I'll be good. Okay. At 9.34 p.m., flight 052 runs out of fuel. The engines flame out. Passenger Nestor Zarate remembers the horrible silence. The lack of that noise is, 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 is it's a horrendous impression because you, you have the wind against the fuselage. So at that moment, there was pandemonium. The crew calmly tells air traffic control that the engines have failed. They are quickly routed back to JFK, but it's too late. When the Boeing 707 crashes into a hillside in Oyster Bay, the cockpit breaks off, killing the pilots and flight engineer. They are just 16 miles from the airport. Come on, somebody get them back here. Miraculously, 85 of 158 people on board survive impact. They are pinned beneath the wreckage, but there's no fire. Clearly, the plane had been filled with fuel. They would have been all incinerated. The safety board report says the cause of the crash is human error, that the flight crew did not effectively manage their fuel or convey how low the fuel levels were. When we talked to the controllers today at the TRACON, none of them were aware of the priority concern and the fuel concern. The crash of Avianca Flight 052 shows that despite dramatic advances in aviation technology, clear communication from the cockpit to air traffic control is key to a safe flight. It reinforced an ongoing issue that we faced worldwide in aviation to make sure that there is not only the transmission of a word, but that there is a transmission of understanding. There's a comprehension. I think that our crew should have been more aggressive, uh, more transparent uh, in expressing the need to have a preferential treatment that night. They waited too long. There was a lot of delayed decision making. Pilots much more effectively work as a team and as a crew now. This is a case where that essential cooperation within a crew could have resulted in, in a different outcome. Astonishingly, many of these crashes, as we have seen, were survivable. But being one of the survivors is not easy. Everybody was demolished physically and psychologically by the crash. So surviving a crash is a miraculous event. And, and one has to be grateful that God or destiny or is giving you a second chance, but uh, there's a price to that. Brand new Why Planes Crash continues next Monday at 9, only on National Geographic Channel. Stay tuned for Alaska's Toughest Pilots.